Throw people as back as possible. So if you try to avoid being called, come up front. Uh, so today, we're going to continue what we've been doing. Uh, the director of our computer science program, which about 60% of you are in, is going to come and uh, do three things. One is he's, he introduce himself, uh, Dr. Satya Narayanan. Second one is uh, he will introduce the field of networking and security. That's his specialty. And he will spend about 20, 25 minutes to go through the detail of the um, individual learning plan for the computer science program. So, of course, the people in the computer science program will be very interested. The people in the CD, I will think you should pay attention to, at least you know, those weird guys in computer science. <laughs> what are they up to, right? What do they learn when they finish the computer science? What, what, what actually they, 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 they have to go through? The CD and CSIC, I would say, about at least one third of the class has overlap. <coughs> so, in the industry, especially the industry now, kind of web or the, the, the mobile, uh, the designer, that's CD, and uh, the developer, the CS student, they work closely together. Often, if you are in a small shop, they are the same person. So even if you are not in the computer science programs, pay attention to see what kind of uh, emphasis, what kind of concentration, what kind of classes the computer science student has to go through. It will, it will help you to talk to you. Okay. So we'll spend quite a few minutes on that. Then uh, afterwards we have uh, Professor Pat Watson come. Pat Watson is uh, our uh, guru on animation, on the digital art, and on the, uh, well actually he teaches uh, digital photography. So we spend about 20 minutes with him on his expertise and his classes. At the end we'll talk a couple minutes on the uh, we want to encourage you to take down internship position. Uh, we want to discuss, try to finalize our grouping. <coughs> then uh, we we'll talk about the assignments uh, for this week. The assignments, a lot of time, assignments just reading. I will trust you read those. They're, often their assignment doesn't have a deliverable. That doesn't mean you don't do it. Uh, if there's no specif specified deadline, the deadline is Anyone read the syllabus? If there's no deadline, what's the default deadline for assignments? The night, the midnight next Wednesday. Okay. I'm not very big on you know you know one minute after deadline you, you, your A work become worthless. I'm not that type of guy, but still I want to I want you to, to submit things on time. Questions, Christina? Tuesday at midnight, start and then Wednesday night. Good afternoon. Is this picking up? Okay. Um, thanks, Eric. Uh, my name is Satya Narayanan. I'm going to talk to you. I, I have two presentations for you today. Um, where I'm, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the projects which I'm working on. So it's kind of introducing the program and myself to you presentation. And then I have another presentation in which I'm going to talk about the um, individual learning plan, which uh, the CSIT students will have to develop as part of this course, which will be your two-year plan in terms of what courses you are going to take in the next two years. So the two separate presentations. So let me start with the first one. Um, Eric mentioned it. Uh, I have a PhD in computer science from uh, what used to be Polytechnic University. It's part of NYU now. It's an institute under uh, New York University. Um, I worked for a little over 10 years in different companies doing research and uh, product development in computer networking products. Uh, I worked for Q Software Systems, I worked for Technical Communications Corporation. Uh, before I came here, I was working for a Panasonic Research Lab, which was uh, located in Princeton, New Jersey, uh, for like about eight years or so. Uh, so we were doing um, how to bring computer communications into the consumer electronics world, right? So that was the focus of that lab, and that's where I was before I came here. In terms of teaching, I've been teaching here since fall of 2007, and I taught for about a year before that in graduate uh, courses in New Jersey Institute of Technology while I was working 
uh, for Panasonic. So my teaching experience is from 2007 or 2006, depending on how you want to want to count it. That's a link to my website. Uh, it's a really old website. I kind of never updated, but it has some information about. Uh, it has publications, research projects I've done in the past, and some of my travel pictures and things like that. So if you have some time to kill, you're welcome to check it out. Any questions about my background you'd like answer before I move on? Okay. I don't want to get to know what you are trying to study. The, um, the answer to the question, what is computer science? If you ask 10 computer scientists, you will get 12 different answers. The reason that is so is computer science is a relatively young field if you compare it to astronomy or biology or anything like that, right? Computer science as a separate department in universities has existed only for about 20, 22 years, right? In, in early 90s is when computer science divided out as a department from mathematics department in the early 90s. Before that, computer science was not a separate academic department, right? So it's a relatively new, actually very new field compared to physics, which has been around for like 200 years, biology for even longer, right? So the, the subject, kind of the understanding of the field is not matured enough that you will get like kind of slight variations of the definitions. I like most of these. Uh, the keywords I kind of look for, uh, like the keywords in, in the definition which I like are, uh, it's about problem solving, right? It's about solving problems. It's about automating problem solving, right? So a computer makes you makes it possible for you to solve some real world problem and it makes it possible for you to automate it so that you can do higher order, like the, the professional can do a higher order thinking, what kind of the dumb quick thing that needs to happen, computer can do it for you. Right? So it makes things better, faster by uh, solving problems using the uh, computational machine, like using automation of problem solving. Does it make sense? The way the degree program is organized is there are nine core courses which all students are required to take. So all computer science students have to take those nine courses. And then you can choose one of five paths. Each of them are called concentrations. So there are four kind of built-in concentrations and one build-your-own concentration option. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But the four concentrations we support, uh, we, we have in our degree program are uh, network and security, which is about being able to design, deploy, and manage computer networks in an efficient, effective, cost-effective manner so that organizations can have all their employees connected. Right? So that is what network and security concentration is about. And of course, secure network, right? Not just functional network, but secure network also so that some bad guy that doesn't come and steal all the information. <coughs> software engineering concentration is, as the name implies, being able to develop software. Whether it is web software, or desktop software, or mobile application software, any kind of software, or network software, you might be writing software for the Cisco switches, right? So <coughs> software that runs in all of these devices we have in the, in the world today, in our society today, Software engineering is about developing software for those devices, right? That is what that concentration is about. Excuse me. The game development concentration is a specialized software engineering concentration, right? The idea here is the type of software you develop is mostly games. I'm sorry. Uh, so mostly games. So games for your, again, mobile devices or games that run on websites or games that run on Xbox. <coughs> and whatever game controllers that are out there. So that is what the game development concentration is. And the information systems concentration, concentration is a hybrid of technology and business. The idea is like how do you use data and make business processes efficient. That is what information systems concentration is about. Right? So those are the four options. So there are three kind of broad research projects which I'm working on. One is called uh, Delay Tolerant Networks. Um, kind of imagine a group of firefighters walking through a forest fire with wireless devices. No uh, cell coverage or anything is available. If they want to communicate among themselves, 
there is this technology called delay tolerant networks and what it allows them to do is you can exchange messages but with accepting a level of delay right so when you send an instant message to your friend you usually kind of expect it to be on that's to on your friend's computer like within a second or so right or even microsecond milliseconds but in a delay tolerant network, that may not be the case. So a firefighter who's on one side takes a picture of something and maybe sends it to the, the team leader who's kind of behind. But there is no direct link available because the student, the, they are far apart from each other. But over a period of time, as they come closer and go away, as they're moving through the forest fire, this technology will make the message reach the destination. So that's called Delay Tolerant Network, and we have been doing some research with uh, the Naval Postgraduate School on, on this. We had a couple of students publish papers by doing research on, on this, this kind of like cutting edge technology, uh, semi cutting edge technology. It's like five, six years old. It's not like literally three months old. Uh, we also have this project where we, are, uh, we have developed Android and Netbook apps with which. Uh, California-wide measurement of wireless bandwidth. So you take your Android phone, install this app, and push a button, and it will test how much throughput you have in terms of what kind of service you are getting in that particular location. So this was funded by uh, California Public Utilities Commission, and we, been, we did a field testing during summer in like 1,200 locations across California, with like students going from, from another university. Not the, the testing was done by another university. We did the software development. So they did it with like send students to 1,200 locations across California and collected this data. We are going to do this again in two weeks, and then we'll do it again early next year. So every quarter, we are going to do it for the next three years or so. So this is a project which I've been involved with Dr. Bjorn and Stephanie Mott, who's our uh, software kind of software program coordinator who works with us on this. And we have like four or five students doing different aspects of this, this software development with us. This is a, this another project which, we, which I just started uh, there's a company called Firekite which makes mesh products, which is again like wireless devices. So on internet, and if you noticed on the on the light poles, there are this thing is propping up. I don't know whether any of you noticed, and there is bucket tracks like installing stuff there. That is basically this project. So Firekite is setting up a test network, and we have we are going to have students doing uh, mesh performance testing. Basically, like you driving in a car and testing how much throughput you are able to maintain while you are going through a mesh network and, and things like that. So this, this just started like two, three weeks ago, the installation started. So this is a project which... Uh, so this is the software engineering one. So let me go back to the general one first. So here is your ILP. So there is on the top, you kind of enter information and who's advising you and things like that. And then you have a list of courses here which you are required to take and what you are identifying is which semester I am going to take it or which semester year I have already taken it is what you are filling out here or if you took it somewhere else you click on the alternate form required saying that this was course was taken by me but it was taken in a different college which transfers right so that is what you will indicate by selecting this and then so here you have a choice, you can select two out of these four. And then you have, depending on your concentration name, you will select three courses to list here for your concentration. And then you have three electives, you can choose from one of these courses, or sometimes we will approve a course which is not listed here, but you have to talk to a faculty. And you will decide when you are going to take all of these courses, and you will fill this up, right? So the main part that needs to be done by the end of this process is this first page filled out with which courses, what time, are you taking taken it already, are you going to take it, did you take it somewhere else. All of that is captured in this one page and that is the plan we approve and once we approve it, you do all of those courses in those times, you will be ready to graduate. Okay? Does it make sense? So. I will talk a little bit about them on how we are going to go about achieving this. It's not really, it's not, it looks long, but it's like 10 steps, right? Not 10 steps, less than 10 steps. Eight steps. Uh, you are going to take the ILP, use the sample as a starting point, but put your pathway worksheet together. And when you put your pathway worksheet together, take into consideration if you are planning to do a minor those courses should be included. Look at the minor requirement and include them. 
if you still have some GE courses you haven't taken, take them. So the sample does not assume, the sample assumes you are not doing a minor and you are done with your GE. Right? So if there are any conditions on those two things, take that into consideration and put the pathway together. Once you have that done, use that to uh, fill out the first page which I showed you where you can say like what semester, what year, which course you are going to take to be able to meet the requirements. Once you have that done, I have a, a checklist and it's always a good thing for somebody else to verify our work rather than us verifying it. We are going to, you are going to get, uh, we have a student ILB advisor who is going to work with you to resolve some of the other problems which you are facing. She will come in next week to this class and introduce herself and she will give you uh, appointment slots. I don't know if you have used appointment slots on calendar. You can create like a lot of slots with like time when she is going to be available in the front office. That will become a link on ILEARN. So there will be a link which you can click on and it will give you all the know. Tuesday from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock there are 30 minute slots, 4 30 minute slots. And then Thursday from 10 to 12, whenever her timing, her office hours are going to be. And she, you will have all of those options. You can click on one of those 30 minute slots that will become, it will, your name will be entered on her calendar and her name will be entered on your calendar so you will have an appointment with her. And then that is when kind of the one-on-one, -on -one, that is when the one-on-one -on -one, uh, help from, for you to solve your problems starts, right? Hopefully 60 to 80 percent of you, what you did for your assignment will be fine. She will just look at it, everything is fine, you don't have any concerns, everything sounds correct to you. She will make an appointment with one of the three faculty, either me or Professor Lockwood or Professor Bion. She will make an appointment with one of them for you, one of us for you, and you can come and get it approved by us. Right? If there is a problem, she will try to give you more help with respect to resolving any issues you have, so that you can do that and then you can come and meet with us to get it approved. And if there is a problem she is not able to solve, again she will make an appointment with us and that we will come, we will help you out with like resolving something which is a very, very unique situation which needs, I don't know, whatever. We will try to solve that for you. Does it make sense? So that's what is ca captured here. So uh, even before you make the appointment, she will kind of grade your assignments and tell you, give you some feedback. So if she has a solution to a problem which you have left in your assignment, she will tell you, please change it this way because of this, this reason. So you can make the change even before you make an appointment with her. And then you make an appointment with her. And then when she is, use the corrections and everything and come to her, and she, after she kind of okays it, she will make an appointment with, uh, so I shouldn't have said this like, do not contact faculty about ILP by yourself. You are welcome to contact us about other things. We want to keep the ILP process kind of like this smooth running process which doesn't kind of get too many requests coming in different directions and uh, complicated. Uh, you are welcome to contact us about anything else other than ILP until we kind of go through this process. Does that sound okay? Any questions on that? Thank you. I'm not going to stay on this one too long because we do need to move on. Um, if you don't know me already, my name is Pat Watson, and I'm a faculty member on the design side of this curriculum. And my primary of expertise involves the idea that digital technology is not just about raw technical production. Digital technology is the most powerful creative force ever devised by man. And there is lots and lots of really powerful stuff and um, creatively. And the majority of it these days is actually based on digital technology. And there are people out there doing incredibly powerful things with the technology and if we've got time. Um, now let's see, that student is now teaching uh, computer animation. Um, Matt Rizisky is now, um, yeah, he's teaching computer animation at community college. We have had, we've had graduates of our programs and our classes go on to work in the 3D animation industry. So uh, we have had some success, and um, and then we got a few other things here. So yeah, these are some samples from both the uh, the uh, beginning level and the intermediate level. But I'm going to stop this because that's not all that we're about today. Now, if you're in taking notes and you're interested in this kind of stuff, I want to bring a couple of things to your attention. Um, 
If you're interested in doing 3D modeling and animation, and you should be, because it's directly related to success in game design. Good game designers either design in 3D or they understand the basics of 3D. Because if you're going to program a game, you have to understand how the programming directly impacts the models and the meshes that you put in the game environment. And so it's important that you know this stuff. Anyway, here's the deal. As a student at the Autodesk site, okay, autodesk.com, you can download fully functional free versions of all the Autodesk software. Okay? And on the web, there are extensive free tutorials on how to use all of the Autodesk software. Um, 3D Studio Max, Mudbox, Motion Builder, and the program that we use most of around here, Maya. And Maya is the gold standard of um, 3D modeling and animation software. It's what Pixar uses, it's what Blue Sky uses, it's uh, what all the major studios use. They use a different form of it, but it is what they use. So, if you're interested in this, write that down, okay? So, and right there. And then what happens is you join the education community, you get the free software, and then they have you hooked for life. Okay. No, no, Monty. So basically, just go to Unity and check out the awards winners. And here's the student section. And I'm going to show you some of the student games we've done, and then you can go check them out some other time. Um, but currently, currently, we are. Um, I've got a couple students working with the Museum of Monterey, and um, uh, yes, my era. <laughs> I see you're a graduate of high school. Okay. But anyway, the Museum of Monterey. What we're doing right now is I've got a couple students that are working on an interactive about the Museum of Monterey where we call up Ghosts from Monterey's Past and then that highlights um, components of the exhibition space at the Museum of Monterey. So we're working with them. And then we're now working out an agreement with this guy. And this guy, um, I, don't, I, I don't know how deep you go into math. The morphohedron, um, well, if you're real serious about math and geometry, you get into some really kind of quasi-spiritual areas. And this guy's definitely into that area. And he was a student of Frank Lloyd Wright. If you know anything about architectural history, Frank Lloyd Wright may be the most important American architect who ever lived. Okay? Maybe one of the most important architects who ever lived anywhere. Well, um, he believed in pure form and essential form. And Stephen is working on, uh, he's working with us, and I've got a student who's now working on this, creating an animation that demonstrates how the morphohedron forms the components of all natural forms in the universe. So anyway, we're working on that. So this is a big deal. This guy, this guy's, um, if you want to go to this site and read this stuff, if you're really into being esoteric, this will definitely do it for you. Um, brilliant guy, brilliant guy. All right, so we saw that. Yeah. Different from, say, graphic design. Um, communication design is much more comprehensive than graphic design. Graphic design is, uh, there are core principles in graphic design that are essential to being a good visual communicator. There's no denying that. But communication design is much broader than that because, for instance, okay, the coming screen environment will be intrinsically 3D, and many of you already know this, they are now working on 3D interfaces that basically look like a 3D tunnel. So, you know, you've got your basic 30 inch screen. Well, the screen you're looking at is no longer a flat desktop. It is actually a 3D environment that you reach into, okay? Now, to know how to design for that involves a radical departure from traditional notions of graphic design. Because graphic, does not, graphic design does not incorporate notions of how you design for a moving space. Okay, have you ever considered that? There are design principles for a moving space, and there are design principles for a three-dimensional space. Now think about the visual mechanics of how do you convince someone that something else is farther back than something else? How do you make that work? Okay? No, it's much more complicated than that. For instance, you can fool the eye by changing the tone of a single color. Okay, for instance, Light blue appears to be in front of dark blue. Okay? Warm colors appear to be in front of cool colors. Okay? Do you understand why and do you understand how to manipulate that? 
So these are some of the fundamental aspects of designing in 3D. And then there are other aspects in terms of designing for motion. For instance, the idea of inertia. Okay, if you don't have inertia and if you don't have ease in and ease out, it does not look natural. And so then the viewer is not as likely to buy into the idea that this is something they should pay attention to. So the use of ease in and ease out, squash and stretch, and these aspects are part of creating a fundamentally persuasive moving environment in 3D. Make sense? Great. Cool. Lots of kind of stuff I talk about. All right. Um, Assignment is I want to spend you maybe about an hour. Well, I said about an hour. So there is this st study strategy. Okay, the study strategy. Most of you, the fact that you are in CSU, you probably study well, but you can always sharpen your skill. Um, there are probably 20 things you have to do on, on the website. Which ask you, you know, how do you do? Uh, how do you keep notes? How do you pay attention? How do you your schedule? Uh, so I will recommend you spend about half an hour, go through it, then say a few things in your blog. I will call learning. So the second one is kind of similar in nature. I want you to go to the My Tool. This is more browsing. You got a lot of different tools. There's one place for you to do a quick uh, test of your own time management skill. Let me show you. My tool and uh, time management quiz. And um, I will recommend you do it if you couldn't find time to do it. <laughs> you're in deep trouble. It's, uh, it's important and only take about five minutes. It will, it will, if you, well, I'm not going to grade it, so to be honest, it will tell you what's your time management skill, uh, and your level. It is crucial for especially our profession. Designer or computer scientist, the time management is crucial. Why? Because we always deal with new project. There's always a deadline. We don't do things like a post office. You just go in there for eight hours. Right? You, there's always a deadline. There's always a new thing to learn. There's always another thing you can add to your design or computer science. So, you have to be able to prioritize say, well, I can only spend this number of hours on this. So time management is important for any profession, but it's particularly more important for your profession. So do well. In the university, the, the faculty will kind of give you, say, for example, I will tell you that this will take you half an hour. In a lot of other profession, your boss or your supervisor will come and say, this needs to be done by Friday. It won't tell you when to do it or how to do it. You just have to figure out. So time management, I will, read, I will want you to spend some time on it. And next, I want to talk to you about just a few things. Then we'll let you go. So I call it uh, the, the Eric's four secrets of moving from a GPA 2.0 to 4.0. It didn't happen to me. Um, so I, I invented this pass secret. So hopefully you. When you, when you read the, that uh, study strategy or time management that hopefully you reflect also upon my experience. So when I was an undergraduate, I was a uh, uh, computer science and uh, well, at that time it's electrical engineering, but computer science is part of uh, engineering. I was, uh, um, I spent a lot of time on student government. I, I go out and party a lot. Um, I have like an unstop, you know, beer party at my door. So after a couple of years, then I realized, wait, I haven't done something in the university. Uh, so I lived in a dorm, and uh, it was uh, it was not a party school, but it, you know, in, in university, party is, is priority number uh, two, maybe two. So, but I really enjoyed my college life. I I I, I, I learned a lot outside of my classroom. I find my mate, my wife. Uh, I, I learned a lot about myself. But things that really helped me, that might help you, is this. The first one is that before my class, I will look at the textbook or notes. So when I, before I go to class, I already know what's being covered. And I write down a few questions that after I review the, I preview the note, 
what, what, what I don't quite understand. What happened to that is that you put the whole class in the framework, you already know the basics. And you go there, you already have a goal, say, I need to have these few questions answered. So if there's a two hour lecture, I will spend about one hour previewing the material. What, what given what give me is that at the end of the two hour lecture, I already understand all the essence. I don't have to go home and say, wait, what, what does that mean? Because I already, in that two hours, I totally absorb it. Okay. So preview about half of the time of the lecture really helped me a lot. So I don't waste my time in the lecture. And also I can just pinpoint the teacher and say, you are wrong in that. <laughs> so that gave me a lot of enjoyment in, in class. I can just point out what's, what, you know, I, I could be the smart ass in the class, but I feel, I feel good, I feel like I learned something. So preview, the second one is, I call it intention, but it's a couple of things. One thing is very difficult, very difficult for, let me see. The, the, the end, <laughs> um, I always sit in the front row. Not that I want to see the saliva coming out of the some faculty, but, but it, it give me, get rid of all my distraction. I don't see other people are doing the Facebook. I don't, I don't smell the you know, people around me. I sit in the front as if the teacher only teach me and that forced me to pay attention. So uh, that attention is important. You know, if you, if you see in the back, that's great. But like this class, most universities, they don't call roles. I, I usually don't call role at all. But you want to get most out of the class, you sit in closely or you pay close attention. And that's one of the reasons. And she put a big name on so the reason why I won't, the, the name taken in front of you is that I will help you to pay attention because you know I can pinpoint you instead of say, oh, that guy in the red shirt, I can say, Jeremy, don't do something. Okay. So attention, I would say, uh, second, we go home. The tree of successful people is that, well, they only